Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, so my name is Olivia. I work as a software developer at camp to camp um, I'm going to talk about a project called Nexus, which we were lucky enough to be part of at camp to camp um, So I've been working at camp to camp for a few years now. Uh, I want to say a few words about the company before we start. So camp to camp is a company that was founded in 2001. Um, it's... Uh, we're closing into 200 employees now, and we're present in three countries, uh, Switzerland, France, and Germany. Um, we, have, um, we have always been doing open source. Open source is really part of the DNA of the company since the start, and since we have grown so much, we're actually one of the biggest companies doing open source in Europe right now. Um, so to explain a bit more how we work with open source. Uh, we're, uh, we're a service company, we're a service providers. So we have a few products that are open source, but we also build a lot of things for our customers based on open source systems. And uh, so we're um, involved in many open source projects, uh, especially uh, open source projects relating to geospatial uh, software. Uh, our vision about open source is that we don't just want to be consumers of these technologies, we want to contribute to them. The first thing is that we want to give back to the communities. Whenever we make money uh, using this uh, software, we want to give back to the community. Uh, what's important for us also is to be, um, uh, to be involved as committers, so being able to contribute regularly to these projects, also do code reviews and these kind of things. And for the project that we use the most, we also want to be part of the PSCs, project steering committees, where we can be involved in strategic decisions and these kind of things. Um, right, so let's talk about Nexus now. Um, so Nexus is the name of a unified information and common system for the French fire departments, uh, rescue services and civil security. Uh, it's a system that enables processing and operational management of alarms and calls made to the emergency phone numbers, basically 18 and 112. So the system will eventually serve 100 departements. So the departments is an administrative level in France. Um, so it's basically all of them, including overseas department. Uh, it's going to be used by 50,000 uh, users and also going to be interacted with by over 200,000 firefighters and other emergency professionals. And it will also support up to 21 million calls per year and 5 million interventions. So you can see these numbers are pretty big. So the scope of the project is really huge. We're not there yet in terms of numbers, but this is the eventual target. To give you a bit more, co more context, the project was started by um, something called the ANSC, which is the National Agency for Civil Security in France. So it's a government agency that depends on the Ministry of Interior. Um, the project uh, has been built by two service companies, uh, camp to camp and another software company called Octo. And there was a proof of concept phase that started in 2018 uh, up to 2020. And since the proof of concept was successful, uh, the actual development of the project started in 2020. And in 2024, we had the first instance of Nexus going live in the south of France, which was a huge moment for everyone involved uh, over all these years. So, yeah, I'm going to lay out uh, a plan for what we're going to talk about next. First, I want to talk about the reasons behind this project, how it came to be, why it became that way, and why open source became so important in it. Then, what it is exactly, what it's made of, and how it was built, and more specifically, which open source projects it relies on. So, the reasons behind Nexus, uh, there's many reasons. So, you have to... Keep in mind that in France, like probably in many other countries, uh, emergencies were historically handled locally. Every fire department, every entity had an area of responsibility and they were handling things in their area, in their own ways. And you know, the way they would work would be very dependent on the kind of territory they would be on, uh, if it was mostly forest or urban territory or maybe seashores or these kind of things. Uh, this means that the whole 
all these entities in the country were using very different systems, very often proprietary uh, software provided by different companies, um, using different business rules, different terminology, uh, different procedures, and that meant that, uh, as a result, the interoperability was abysmal across all this, across the country. And, of course, there was also a lot of redundant development costs. This is where Nexus comes into play, because the, really the goal of the project was to unify all this and make all these entities, all these organizations, be able to communicate with each other. Um, and I want to mention one thing that was probably a tipping point for this, because you know <clears throat> people have probably been discussing the, the need for unifying everything for years. What happened is that a few years ago, very unfortunately, there were um, several um, terror attacks in France, and that showed that the emergency system in these kind of situations was simply, it simply crumbled under the load, and it wasn't made to handle these kind of uh, situations. And that's where people really decided to start uh, this huge undertaking. Uh, so the goal of Next is to, is to end up with a modern web architecture, so everything is web-based. Uh, also, the goal is to facilitate integration with other information services. Uh, basically, we don't want to end up to go from having many small bubbles into one big bubble that still cannot communicate with the outside world. Uh, we want to improve the techniques used for geolocation, for example, also routing, these kind of things, and provide a, a mobile application for emergencies as well. Another very important topic in all this is uh, what we call digital sovereignty. So, because the agency um, depends on the, it's a government agency, there was a very strong political will to uh, make a system and make a product that was really in possession of uh, you know, the agency and the, basically the state um, uh, organizations. That means that uh, we want to be in charge of the roadmap of the project. We don't want to depend on the company deciding on their priority and maybe fixing something one or two months later. We want to be in charge of how the product is used, how it's maintained. We want to decide which companies are going to be able to work on this as service providers. We also want to make sure that the code uh, stays closed because the code of the project itself is obviously closed source for security reasons, and it has to stay this way. This way. And having, uh, avoiding leaks of the code is actually very important. So being in charge of the code uh, is, a, is a good point for that. Uh, we want to be able to fix security vulnerabilities as soon as they show up. Um, so this is all part of the digital sovereignty uh, topic, which is very important um, for, the, for the French government. You can see on the picture here, there was a former Ministry of Interior that was part of this uh, Nexus uh, conference. Um, oh, okay, so interoperability, I mentioned that before. It's a term that comes up pretty often in this presentation, actually, um, because it's very central. The goal of Nexus is to um, uh, improve uh, communication between fire departments, but also improve uh, communication with other emergency services. Because if we set up a very efficient system, for example, for routing, which is the act of you know, finding the, the cheapest or the fastest uh, path in a road network, for example, it wouldn't make sense to do something else for the police, for example. This has to be common to all emergency services. So here, interoperability is critical. Um, Next, it's also made to comply with the emergency management shared uh, information, which is a European standard. And we want to also be interoperable with other actors like the urban gas transport network, electricity transport networks, highway companies, these kind of actors that are very relevant when it comes to emergencies. Um, another topic that was also part of the reasons behind Nexus is the topic of digital commons. So, Digital Commons is something that's, I feel it's, it's a bit similar to open source software. There's this idea that we have, uh, for example, in that case, national data sets. Uh, and then Nexus project, because it needs so, so such fine-grained data, will contribute to have better uh, data sets. And because it relies on those data sets as well, other people will contribute to it. And you have this kind of virtual circle where, where people use the commons, and then they enrich it, and then they get um, improvements from other entities. 
so you see here the picture. It was also like, it's all quite political. You, hear, you see here that the director of the agency and the director of the French Geospatial um, Geographic National Institute signing a paper agreement. And that was a big deal, actually. Like, politically, that was very heavy. I wasn't there. <laughs> Um, right, synergies, which is basically reducing costs, because uh, obviously by avoiding to have all these entities doing these development uh, efforts everywhere in the country, even though we, we're going, the Nexus project is costing uh, several billions maybe, it's still cheaper than having all these entities doing it themselves. So we're actually saving money out of all this. Um, one last thing very quickly, so from the start, the user, the end users were really involved in the project. Uh, this was something that was also really important of the, uh, in the project and probably one of the reasons it was successful in the end. Uh, so you see these people here are firefighters. You can see like the little red band, which is the official outfit. Uh, and they were part of the project from the start. They wrote, or wrote part of the spe specifications, made the tests. Uh, gave feedback and did all these uh, iterative loops to improve the software. Um, right, so what is Nexus exactly? What is it composed of? So there's two main systems. There's an alarm management system and there's an operations management system. The alarm management system is where uh, we receive calls and warnings from the mobile application and qualify them. We define you know, how many people are involved, what kind of uh, situation it is, and then we transfer it once it's qualified. We transfer it to the operations management system. And this is where users have an overview of what's going on, what the resources, uh, what uh, are the available resources, and where users can assign resources to interventions or emergencies. This is also where you have uh, very strong interoperability with other services like the police and ambulances. Um, so these two systems are, you know, it's, it's really uh, applications that have to be very efficient because when you use them, it's really uh, every second counts. Uh, so they have to be extremely reactive and give the right information at the right time. So it was, it, it's, it's a very challenging project. Uh, see here, this is a sample screenshot of the alarm management system. So you see you have a map which gives you a context of uh, the geolocation of the call. And then you have all these options where the user can qualify the, what's going on based on what the people is uh, telling on the phone. Um, so as quickly as possible, the operator has to qualify what's going on. You know, is it a, is it a, um, a fire, is it an explosion, are there people injured, what kind of injury it is, etc. Um, once this is done, this is transferred to the operation management system. And again, you have a map. Um, and then the map will show you an overview of what's going on in your area. And also, you have a list of things, emergencies, interventions, and then you can have also a list of resources. And you can assign uh, resources to um, emergencies and things like that. So again, you know, everything has to be really efficient here. Um, and you can imagine that here there was a really big topic, which was user experience. Uh, there was a lot of effort put into user experience so that the users could be as efficient as possible uh, with these tools and um, take the right decisions at the right time. There's a third tool as well, which is uh, more like a back office tool where people can work on the underlying geospatial data, you know, and maybe fix it or enrich it if, the, if it's needed. So it's not in an emergency situation, but it's also very important because the whole system runs on very precise geospatial data. Right, so how was it made? So the project, the whole project, including the proof of concept, was uh, made using agile methodologies. Um, so currently there's eight development teams. Three of them are from camp to camp. Uh, each team is one product owner and four to five developers. It's been over 110 sprints so far. Um, it's um, in, in the company, it's been really a good example of su a successful uh, agile project because it's quite a big project, and with several teams like that, you can imagine how hard it would be to coordinate things and people working on it. 
and still end up really being really successful. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say it's a good inspiration for all the company of uh, how to run successfully an Agile project. And maybe people here have experiences with Agile methodologies. It's not always easy to implement them, and they can actually end up being counterproductive it's, if it's done wrong. So I think it's really, uh, it's really, it's really interesting, re really interesting thing about this project. So the use of open source um, was uh, essential from the start. It was actually a very strong requirement from the agency. Uh, there are national policies uh, in uh, France that encourage using open source software for uh, government agencies and things like that. But the agency that was in charge of this was really asking for open source, um, which was a very good news because that's what we do. <laughs> we were very happy. Um, the benefits they were looking for were mainly that because they knew that the project would be so big, they would have some kind of influence or leverage uh, over the underlying softwares. That means, for example, that you know, if they use a certain software and the performance is not good enough, with that leverage, they can say, well, you know, we're going to improve that. Uh, we're going to pay for an improvement, for a performance improvement. We're going to pay for a security improvement um, because they have, yeah, they have this critical size to do it. Um, also, because the, when, you, when you use open code, um, it makes it safer in a way because if the solution is used a lot and there's a security flaw in the code, people will start complaining really quickly, and then it doesn't go unnoticed. This wouldn't be so uh, obvious, for example, for with a closed source software um, that would be made by a, a company. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to do audit of the code, for example. Here, with open source, you're always sure that, you know, if there is a problem, it's going to be, people are going to complain and you're going to fix it quickly. Um, one last thing is uh, synergy with other projects, other users of the project. That's something uh, quite important, actually, and I have a few concrete examples afterwards. Uh, a few words about how the source code was built. Um, so the software is built using clean architecture, which is a layer-based architecture, which is essential when you have multiple teams working on it. There's very high quality standards, uh, obviously a lot of testing involved. Hosting is done on Scaleway, which is a, a French cloud provider, which is a sovereign cloud approved. Um, right, and then you have, I just want to say also a few words about how the company um, handles uh, cooperation with uh, our customers or our partners. What's something really important for us is that um, we want to build a relationship of trust with our customers. Um, the agency comes with knowledge about emergency systems, for example, and we come with the knowledge of how to make software. And we really want to be able to understand exactly what they need, what they're facing, and what their problems are. And we also want them to understand what we're struggling with, what we are facing, and what our limitations are. So that's why that's where the motto "Excellence Together" comes from uh, at Camp to Camp. Okay, there's also a part where uh, Camp to Camp is training people to use the software, so train the trainers, this kind of things. Uh, this is going to be ongoing for probably years, I think. Let's talk a little bit about the open source components that are used in the project. Um, yeah, this is going to be a bit technical. <laughs> it's okay. Um, right, so we use um, the whole system is built on, um, is relying on the Postgres uh, databases. Uh, so Postgres, we use Postgres, obviously. We also use two uh, very important extensions, which are PostGIS and PG Routing. Uh, PostGIS is a uh, a very, a very common extension that lets you manipulate geospatial concepts like geometries, uh, will, and it lets you, you measure area, um, join geometries, simplify, etc. And then PG routing will um, give you um, a very efficient routing. So basically, you give it a graph, typically a network, a road network, and then it will give you the cheapest path across it from point A to B. 
So to uh, feed this uh, database, we set up uh, several pipelines using Apache Airflow, which was extremely useful. So Airflow is an ETL software. ETL means extract, transform, and load. It's essential because then all the users of the system can upload data in many different formats, many different shapes, and uh, Airflow is able to uh, pros process them and then load them into the database in a unified way which can then be used by the, by the software. This is also very important because uploading data from the users is a big part of the, of the, of the system. Right, then I want to talk about GeoServer Cloud because this is a very uh, interesting example of uh, open usage of open source uh, software. Um, so GeoServer is a map engine. Anyone knows GeoServer here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's very famous, <laughs> but maybe it's just my, my view of the things. Um, so it's a Java um, map engine. So basically you provide it with various kind of data sources and it will um, provide you with services uh, uh, over this data, it will let you query the data and transform it, output it in various uh, formats and, for example, transform the um, coordinate systems from one to another, to, to another, so very useful operations when you want to work with maps. Um, it's very powerful, it works really well, but it's still a Java application, which means that it can crash. Um, you know, if it runs, sometimes it runs out of memory, uh, that's, that's life, and uh, that's obviously not an option when you have a system like that where even if a minute of downtime could be a catastrophe, especially because it will probably happen at the worst time possible. Um, so people have been using workarounds for this, for having high availability geo servers um, for years. But some very smart people in the project came up with the idea to do a cloud native version of geo server. Um, cloud native means um, that basically instead of having one process handling all the requests, you have this kind of pods running and you, can, you have several pods and the requests are shared equally between the pods and if a pod crashes then it's okay because the other one, the other ones can handle it. And if you have you know, a period when you know that it's going to be a lot, of, a lot more requests, for example, the Olympics are coming in your country, <laughs> then you can like multiply by 10 the amount of, po the, the amount of pods. Um, and that was, um, I think, it, it worked out because this, uh, the project was at the confluence of people having um, good ideas and vision, and also the money was there, and the technical skills were there, because we at Camp to Camp were, were, we were able, um, uh, able to do it. Sorry. So, what happened there is that the agency said, okay, we're going to fund it, and they kick-started the cloud-native version of GeoServer, and they put something like 30,000 euros in it, which is really not that much, but because there was so much need for high availability uh, GeoServer, the project gathered interest very quickly. We, did, we communicated uh, about it in various conferences, and very quickly other actors manifested interest and started funding and contributing to it. And it became really big. You have companies like SwissRe, which is a Swiss reinsurance company, which contributed a lot to the project. Now it's used by other actors in France. It's also used by Deutsche Telekom, for example, and Bundesamt for Cartography and Geodesie in Germany. It's, it's very successful and very, we're very happy about it. And for the agency, you know, it's a typical, it's a great example of synergy on open source. They just provided the initial funds, which is really not that much compared to how much money was spent in the project overall. And they get all the benefits from it. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's really the best example in, in this project of Synergy. Another good example is uh, with uh, a library called Open Layers. So you've seen that everything is based on web pages in this project. Uh, GeoServer will provide the data um, to render on the map, but then you need a web mapping library to show it, actually show it. This is what OpenLayers does. So OpenLayers is a project that's very dear to me because uh, I'm completely biased because I'm a contributor and I love it. Um, it's a very performant uh, library that will let you uh, create maps out of many different kinds of data. 
And it will let you do like heat maps, clustering, for example, when you regroup points and have a small number, uh, drawing, measurement. Uh, you can also modify the data that you see on your map. Um, so all the maps that are shown in Nexus are based on what we call vector ties. So you know ties, uh, we've all seen them on maps. You know, when you load a map, and you have these kind of squares appearing one after the other. They can be images, but they can also be this kind of uh, bunch of uh, vector shapes, like lines and polygons. This is what we call vector ties. Um, and vector ties give a really good render, really crisp maps. You can you know, uh, filter out things and change the styling. It's very performant. And historically, OpenEOS has been struggling a bit with vector ties because it was so uh, intense sometimes. But the good news is that last year we had a contract with the city of Hamburg to improve the rendering of vector ties in open layers. So again, the agency was relying on this uh, technology and they got the improvement for free, kind of, um, by, yeah, again, by a, good, by a synergy on an open source project. So that's, I think, another good example. All uh, right, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, so next is, is mission critical open source based system um, it's a living proof that it's possible, that you can make a mission-critical system out of open source, and that you can actually save lives with open source. Yeah, that's it. I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Olivia? Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that uh, Camp to Camp had a really integral part um, and did well with managing the eight teams with four to five engineers uh, each or however large. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you think Camp to Camp did right with that large of an engineering group doing doing different things? Uh, sorry, I didn't... Um... So, um, uh, what did Camp to Camp do well with managing such large groups um, of different engineers? Um, right, so there was a... So basically, the project is using um, derivative of Scrum, right? And um, we are... So the other company actually set up this methodology, which is not like standard. Um, there's this concept of, uh, so the, each team has a product owner, and then you have a meta product owner group, which uh, also meets and kind of spreads the, the stories across. Um, yeah, but um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you so much more details on the organization. Yeah. Um, you had one slide where you very convincingly argued that open source um, software is better for security, and um, you had a different slide where you very uh, elaborately argued that um, the source code could not be made public um, for your project yeah. um, uh, for security reasons. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, this is from the point of view of the agency, right? They want to be in charge of the security of their product. So they, want to, they don't want other people to look at the code of the project, right? That makes sense. Uh, because then, I mean, if your emergency system runs on a code that is public, then it's kind of um, asking for problems, right? But, but, it, but it is running on all this code that's public, that, like PostGIS that you mentioned and all, all this other code. Yeah. Well, it's... Um, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right, so the, the, using open source solutions, the security comes from this kind of crowd, uh, uh, crowd-based crowd security. A lot of eyes will look at the code and will find uh, vulnerabilities. And then the, the, the code that kind of glues everything together, that has to be closed source. But really, you know, a lot of the um, workload is done by these open source components. You know, they weren't going to rewrite a map engine, for example, or you know, a library for doing routing. That wouldn't make any sense. That wouldn't even be possible. Uh, so it's a compromise, right? The glue, the code that glues everything together stays closed. And there, the agency are the only ones that are, are looking at it. All right. Thank you, Olivia. We are unfortunately run out of time. Okay. Thank you.